because I was right on time. Um, I am Lincoln Bundy, and I think I'm going to be the caboose at the end of this incredible, wonderful day. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, I uh, am going to, um, well, first of all, my position is now co-director of the uh, organization called Defending the Early Years. And I am going to talk to you today about becoming an early childhood advocate and activist. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you about advocacy. And my talk is going to be divided into three parts. First, I want to tell you a personal story, which I think illustrates how important it is that we all become activists for young children. Next, I'll brief, briefly talk to you about what has happened uh, to education policy in the last dozen or so years, um, and, and particularly what they are calling the reform movement. And finally, I want to talk about how you can become an advocate and an activist for young children using the resources that Defending the Early Years can provide. So, as many of you know, I was the executive director of the Alliance for Early Childhood for 25 years. And before that, <laughs> uh, and before that, I was a teacher at Willowwood Preschool. Uh, my four kids went through the Winneka Public Schools, and eight of my ten grandkids live on the North Shore um, and attend schools here, um, currently at Hubbard Woods, Washburn, Sunset Ridge, and the Glenview Public Schools. The other two live in Boston. So as a teacher, administrator, parent, and grandparent, I have been intimately involved in the North Shore's educational community for more years than I care to admit. <laughs> Now, because of my Defending the Early Years job, I'm hearing from parents and teachers and administrators from all across the country, and I truly understand how lucky we are to have the schools that we have here. So now I want to tell you a personal story that illustrates the, that difference between the schools we have here and schools in other parts of the country, and apologies to those in the world who've already heard this story. My daughter's family moved to Massachusetts in 2013, and they chose a town that they thought was going to be Winnetka East with similar schools. Uh, their uh, twin daughters would enter fourth grade, and their son, whom I will call William, would start kindergarten. The first clue that the Massachusetts school was going to be different was when we learned that the first day of kindergarten would be a full day, 9 a.m. to 3.15, with no plans for tra transition, beyond uh, a reception for families in the kindergarten room two days before school started. The second clue was the fact that while there was a very small block corner and a very small housekeeping corner, most of the room was set up with tables and chairs, and I saw folders labeled with kids' names saying math and reading and all sorts of other academic pursuits. And the posted schedule in the classroom talked about lots of work time and very little play time. On the first day of kindergarten, William went off like a trooper. Six and a quarter hours later, William and his classmates marched out single file, or should I say dragged out, to the pickup spot uh, where we were to pick him, to meet him and pick him up because no parents were ever allowed in that school. I've never seen so many exhausted looking kindergartners in my entire life. The next two days, William went to school somewhat reluctantly, and when he came home, he reported that the table tasks were hard and that he couldn't do them. By the fourth day, uh, William announced that he didn't want to go back to school, and there were emails between his teacher and the school social worker, and it was decided that the social worker would meet us at the front door and escort William to his kindergarten class because, as I said, no parents allowed in the school. On the fifth day of kindergarten, William locked himself in his bedroom and hid under his bed. It was then that we knew that this kindergarten was not going to work for him. We found a nearby preschool with a young Fies class, and William was soon comfortable in that class, but he frequently uh, uh, reminded his classmates that the t there was a terrible kindergarten waiting for them. <laughs> Meanwhile, the girls in fourth grade were having their own issues, finding their classes very different from the hands-on, project-based learning that they were used to at Hubbard Woods. Instead, school was mostly worksheets, rote learning, and test prep. 
and there were tears every single morning. So in my own family, I was seeing up close what millions of uh, children and millions of families are dealing with across the country in schools devoted to push down academics, test prep, lack of play, limited or no recess, and inappropriate curriculum. And it was just heartbreaking. However, this story has a happy ending. Shortly after school began, my son-in-law found out that his travel schedule had changed and he was only going to be in Boston half the time and on the road the other half. Um, because of uh, the serious concerns about the schools and about how unhappy the children were, they decided to move back to Winnetka. And that's what they did in, in mid-December. The girls happily rejoined their classmates in fourth grade at Hubbard Woods and William joined Lynn White's afternoon kindergarten class, and Lynn's in the audience somewhere today. <laughs> um, so after casing Lynn's Reggio-inspired classroom and finding a huge block area, a housekeeping corner, Legos, and multiple art supplies, and learning that he would not be doing worksheets in this kindergarten, he settled in quickly and had a wonderful year. I always say thank you to Lynn. But that experience made me realize that most families don't have the option to return to a progressive school district like Winnetka's. Their children are stuck in these schools for better or for worse. How many Williams decide that they hate school by the fifth day of kindergarten and don't want to go back? How many young children cry every morning before going to school? I was asked to become the co-director of Defending the Early Years last January. And this personal experience, along with the many upsetting stories I was hearing from all over the country, made me realize how important our advocacy work is. So now let's turn to education policy. What has caused such a change in our classrooms? It began with George Bush's No Child Left Behind that added high stakes testing which judged schools and teachers on the basis of one test and punished schools for not increasing their scores every year Supposedly, quote, every child was supposed to be at grade level by the year 2012. Ha, ha, ha. Anybody who wrote that law would have never been a teacher. <laughs> we had high hopes for Barack Obama's uh, race to the top, but that continued high stakes testing and punishment for schools, and in some ways was even more stringent than No Child Left Behind. Then in 2010, the National Governors Council proposed the Common Core State Standards be adopted by all states. Unfortunately, few educators and no early childhood educators were involved in writing the quickly uh, rolled out Common Core State Standards, which were soon adopted by 25 states. Bill Gates got involved um, and donated millions of dollars for publicity campaigns um, to sell Common Core to everybody, but note that his three children attend private school and therefore are not affected by Common Core. In December 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, was enacted with the express purpose of fixing some of the things that didn't work for No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. It rolled back some of the federal government's oversight and returned it back to the states. That law takes full effect in the 2017-2018 school year, so the jury is still out. And now comes the great unknown as far as education policy, Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos. What else can I say? <laughs> but let's go back to 2012. As the Common Core standards became mandated, people realized how inappropriate they were, especially for the youngest students. For example, all kindergartners were expected to read emergent literature texts with purpose and understanding. Of course, we all know that not all kindergartners can read, and that some children start to read at age four, and others don't read until age seven. However, in order to comply with Common Core, kindergartens across the country were turned into the new first grade, and appropriate hands-on learning through play was replaced with worksheets and drill and kill, much like my grandson's kindergarten in Massachusetts. Many teachers were horrified by what they were expected to do and, and noticed an increase in discipline problems, anxiety, and other troubling behaviors. So in this increasingly negative climate, in 2012, nationally known advocates Dr. Nancy Carlson Page and Dr. Diane Levin had had enough. They gathered other like-minded early childhood educators like Lillian Katz, Constance Kinney, and Maurice Sykes, 
and they founded Defending the Early Years. Uh, Defending the Early Years mission is to mobilize the early childhood community, to track the effects of the new standards, and to promote appropriate practices. To fulfill its mission and accomplish these goals, Defending the Early Year has employed the following publications, such as our comprehensive reports and position papers, presentations like uh, the one I'm doing today, and by the way, this is the first time that I have represented Defending the Early Years on my own, uh, and it was kind of nice to get my feet wet in a friendly environment <laughs> filled with lots of friendly faces, so thank you. Um, the third is to facilitate advocacy, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about that in a minute. An online presence, including our website, Facebook, and Twitter, and collaboration with like-minded organizations. You're probably most familiar with our publications, including several reports on topics such as reading in kindergarten, the Common Core Math Standards, assessment, and our latest report just released uh, last month, Teachers Speak Out. We've also written uh, one and two page position papers on topics including Common Core, policy, and testing. And all of these publications and many more can be found on our website and we hope that you will visit it often. And now, the final and probably the most important part of this presentation, as part of our mission to mobilize the early childhood community to speak out, this part will address how you can become an activist for, for appropriate early childhood education. In this day of education reform requiring practices that we as experienced early childhood educators know are inappropriate, Often teachers feel alone and that they are battling power, powerful forces by themselves. Well, to begin with, I hope that after spending today with 200 like-minded individuals, that you will return to your classroom inspired by what you've heard in today's sessions, but also inspired <laughs> to become an early childhood activist yourself. Just imagine if each of the 200 people in this room reached out and touched one or two or five or ten people, how many we could touch. But why, as a profession, have we become so quiet? Well, as early childhood educators, many of us are nurturers by nature. We build trusting relationships with children and help them to get along with others. Maybe we are peacemakers and not troublemakers at heart. But there, it, this is the thing. We have to be troublemakers. We have to be troublemakers now, and that's okay. There's such a thing as being a troublemaker for good. I think that's what early childhood activism is, being a troublemaker for good. So what can we do? Becoming an activist sounds like a daunting challenge, but taking on small, doable tasks can bring big rewards. And note that all the action steps that I will talk about are on uh, your handout that is in your folders and will also be on the website, the Alliance website. For example, the first is just to start talking. One of the best organizing tools is the one-on-one -on -one conversation, <laughs> making a personal connection with someone else about whatever the issue is. It's a great step to build momentum. Talk to your colleagues, friends, and neighbors. Do you feel comfortable talking to the parents of your students? They may have some similar uh, concerns. And while you may think that you're alone, I think that you'll be surprised at how many others share your views. Once you've identified some like-minded people, consider bringing them together for a meeting. Defending the early years can help you with that. On our website, you'll find resources such as our mobilizing kit, which includes a section on how to plan a meeting, including signs, a sample agenda, sign-in sheets, and other ideas and resources. There are also ideas about what to do during the meeting. Once you've identified your concerns, brainstorm next steps that you could do together. As you brainstorm, it's important to develop a clear message, and that message should be what you're for, not just what you're against. It's powerful to use examples from your own classroom or school, uh, or in my case, my grandson's reaction to the kindergarten in Massachusetts. Be sure to make clear the outcomes that you hope for, such as more learning through play in kindergarten or daily recess for elementary school children. <coughs> Next, and so important, is to communicate your concerns. Write letters to your school board, 
to uh, your congressman or senator's office to the local um, newspaper. In our mobilizing kit is a page advising you how to write an effective letter. Also, it is so easy to call your congressman or senator's office. Here is the number, which um, goes to any senator or any congressman, you just ask for them. Sometimes they ask for your zip code. And you should put this number in your iPhone right now. Now I'll read it to you. 202-225-3121. So I just called Senator Duckworth and Senator Durbin's office about, uh, recently about Betsy DeVos. And it was so easy to call that I ended up calling about two dozen senators, uh, anybody who uh, was either on the fence or, or on the um, education committee. Um, and, and know that you don't have to give a 15-minute you know, lecture about why you're for or against something, um, or if you're writing a letter or for a four-page tome. Um, note that my, my youngest son, Reed, worked for Congressman Mark Kirk when he was literally right out of college, his first job out of college. And so everybody who's reading your letter or answering the phone is definitely wet behind the ears. And they will only um, tally your call or your letter as a yay or nay. On the other hand, they consider every letter or every call received as representative of the views of thousands of voters. So it's so important to keep, um, to keep communicating with um, your congressmen and your senators. Um, email, of course, is an easy way to not only reach your friends and colleagues, but also email Washington. And this, um, this email address has the emails of everybody from Trump all the way down. And again, very easy to shoot off an email, and it will be tallied. And finally, write about your experiences in your classroom, uh, what you've observed um, since the mandates. Defending the Early Years has a guest blog page, and we would love to publish your piece and give you a forum. One recent guest blog was written by a second grade teacher in an underfunded uh, public school in Boston. She asked her students to write about what their dream school would be, and she expected to hear about swimming pools and candy for snacks and pony rides and that kind of stuff, but she said that's not what they, what they asked for at all. What they did ask for were uh, for enough pencils, erasers, and markers, and a chance to go on field trips. So after that, she asked them to um, to draw a mural of the, their dreams. And um, then she, her, her blog and this photo was picked up by Valerie Strauss of the Washington Post and got national attention. And actually, a lot of our materials have been picked up by the national press. So please start writing and um, send, send me anything that you would like to, uh, to have us considered for, your, for our guest blog. Next is to stay informed. All of these organizations listed on the slide are involved in advocacy. Um, and their contact information is listed also on your handout. Um, yeah, badass teachers. <laughs> That's a real organization. Uh, so check out their website and sign up to receive their mailings. For example, if you sign up for Defending the Early Years, um, you will receive a monthly e-newsletter. You can also friend us on Facebook and Twitter if you want more frequent communication. And speaking of Facebook and Twitter, it's so important these days to communicate through social media, as our current president has uh, demonstrated. The advocacy organizations listed on the previous slide will send you recent research current stories and other news. Pass these on to your friends and colleagues through social media. This is indeed a powerful tool. Use it to spread the word. In fact, you can become a, an effective advocate and activist and never leave your home or classroom by using social media. Next is to do something to generate attention. Attend a school board meeting and speak up. Bring along several colleagues to support you. Attend an event put on by your congressman and voice your concerns. Again, this counts for like the opinions of thousands of voters if you actually attend a meeting um, by your congressman. Circulate a petition and then deliver it in person. Here are links to two online petitions. For example, an activist in Minneapolis uh, created an online petition calling for 30 minutes of recess for every child in the Minneapolis public schools. In just 24 hours, she had over 400 signatures and when they delivered it to the Minneapolis School Board, they had 800 signatures. 
One of my favorite events was a play-in put on in the lobby of the district offices of the Chicago Public School a few years ago. If you're really feeling like being a troublemaker, remember a troublemaker for good, uh, participate in a demonstration, rally, a march, a sit-in, or a walk-up. The Women's March is still fresh in our minds about how powerful a rally and march can be. Here I am with this, one of the signs I carry during the Women's March, which says, appropriate standards, assessment, and classroom practices for all young children. And another personal example, um, two years ago, when the first park exams were being given, a handful of us, including uh, parents and teachers and me as a grandmother, um, started an opt-out uh, effort, and we were able to rally lots of parents to opt their kids out of taking the park test. In fact, we got 32% of the Winnipeg Public School students to participate, and that number was duly noted, uh, I would say, by the Chicago Tribune and down in Springfield as well. Uh, and finally, if you've been inspired to try some of these activist ideas, becoming a troublemaker for good, um, defending the early years can help you fund it. We provide uh, up to 20 <laughs> mini grants each year of between $200 and $500. And this can uh, fund printing costs or refreshments, technology, childcare, whatever you need to make your advocacy effort a success. The application is on the Defending the Early Years website and we encourage you to take advantage of it. So in conclusion, we are at a crossroads today for what is happening to young children and the education that they're receiving. With the Trump administration, we are undoubtedly entering a new phase with it and with it increasing need for all of us who care about young children to speak up and to make our voices heard. So join us at Defending the Early Years Become an early childhood activist. Become a troublemaker for good. A whole generation of children are depending on you to speak up for them. Onward.